Ringtone. And normally I would introduce each speaker. I should introduce each speaker and give their talk, name of their, their talk, but I'm not actually sure if I have the current names. I haven't tried to collect that information yet because a lot of the project titles will have changed. But, go, but I will stay online until, I, I know I can hear you. Let me go ahead and share your screen. So I'll ask the speakers to introduce themselves, I guess. Uh, it's a little safer that way, so go ahead. Ryan, go ahead and start when you're ready. We can see your screen. All right, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Beakley. For the last year, I've been working with Professor Jesse Berezovsky on a renormalization group approach to ordered phases in music. So the big question that we're trying to answer for this project is how do we choose pitches to use in music? Um, theoretically, there's an entire continuum of frequencies that you could use. But historically, um, the choice of pitches has been informed by experience or the preference of the performers or composers. Um, so Professor Berezovsky has previously shown that you can consider musical harmony and intonation uh, in terms of an ordered phase of sound. Tuning systems sort of emerge in analogy to the way that physical phase transitions occur, such as a crystal structure emerging from disordered liquid molecules. Um, and so he first studied this using the mean field approximation. And my goal is to reassess this treatment of harmony as an ordered phase using renormalization group or RG theory. And by understanding how these ordered structures emerge in harmony, we hope to further understand how or why music is created. Um, so like many good stories, we begin in ancient Greece. Um, the most popular version of this story is that Pythagoras was one day heard a blacksmith using different sizes of anvils and noticed that the differences between the pitches on the different sizes of anvils um, so he went home, he built a monochord, and then studied the pitch relations between when a string of different lengths and different length ratios is plucked. Um, so the simplest interval of, of ratios is, or is just an octave, which is doubling of the frequency. So the string would be in a relationship of two to one. Uh, and the next simplest relationship is a perfect fifth, which is a three to two ratio. And if you stack, say, five of these perfect fifths, you get what we call a pentatonic scale in what's called Pythagorean tuning. And one of the central problems in music theory is that if you stack 12 of these perfect fifths, so we just start with one base frequency and multiply by three halves 12 times, we end up with the note that is slightly out of tune with the note that is seven octaves higher than when we started. So you can see that three halves to the 12th is about 129, which is not quite 128 or two to the seventh. So later on into the Middle Ages, the um, dominant tuning system is what we would call 12-tone, five-limit, just intonation. Um, this is where all the frequencies are chosen in simple whole number ratios relative to some base frequency. Um, and all of these ratios are powers of two, three, and five. So for example, nine over eight would be three squared over two cubed. Um, and the system has very consonant um, perfect fifths and perfect fourths. But the thirds and sixths in the system are very out of tune, and you're limited to melodies and chords based exclusively around whatever starting frequency you chose. Getting into the 17th and 18th century was the development of mean tone systems. Um, these are created by slightly detuning certain just intonation ratios. Um, so for the example of the um, for the example of the 12 perfect fifths. You can uh, make each interval just slightly smaller so that when you get to the last note, you actually exactly match up with that seventh octave that I mentioned before. So in this system, the fifths and fourths are a little more out of tune, but the thirds and sixths are much more consonant and much more usable. And you can now modulate to a slightly different tonal center. Later into the 19th century and into the present day, the standard now is what's called 12 tone equal temperament, where you simply take an octave and divide it up into some even number of pitches, usually 12. All of the intervals can be considered as equally out of tune. So it's not as consonant as say just intonation, but there's no preference for a particular tonal center and you can, there's a lot more flexibility in the notes or chords you can choose. 
So each of these tuning systems balances a trade-off between, sorry, that should say lower dissonance for uh, a higher note variety. So the least dissonance you could have between pitches is just one note, but that's very boring to listen to. And so as we add more and more pitches, we introduce more and more dissonance. So physical systems in the same way balance, um, sorry, that should again say lower energy or higher energy for higher entropy. So at the and the temperature is the parameter that um, handles this trade-off. So at low temperature, a state will be low energy, which is preferred, but low entropy, which is not preferred. And then at high temperature, the state will be high entropy, which is preferred, but a high energy, which is not what you want. And so you have to balance this trade-off between these two factors. And this leads to the analogy between the free energy of a physical system, which is we want to minimize the free energy, and the free energy of a sort of musical system that minimizes dissonance and maximizes note variety. So initially, um, Professor Brzezowski uh, used a mean field model to solve for the pitches of, on a system of tones on an interact or on a lattice. Um, again, by treating the dissonance between pitches as an interaction Hamiltonian and using the mean field approximation, which is to say that we take an average interaction over every pitch on the lattice. And this dissonance depends on this critical bandwidth parameter omega c, which I'll explain a little more about later. You next compute the note variety in the same way that we compute classical entropy, um, essentially taking the total number of configurations. So if you had, say, a melody with two notes and you only had two choices of pitch, then you would have um, two squared or four configurations. So for n notes, we have two of the n configurations. And then for some set of configurations with probability, you see this formula here for the entropy, as we all expect. You then introduce a temperature parameter that regulates the trade-off between minimizing the dissonance and maximizing the note variety, and then calculate a probability distribution which minimizes this free energy here. So this is a plot of one of the results from the mean field model. Um, this is the probability density of different pitches across different temperatures. You can see at high temperature, there's a disordered phase where all of the pitches have equal likelihood. This could be considered unmusical, unorganized sound. And then at a temperature of around 21, there's a transition to this 12-fold symmetry where we see 12 evenly spaced peaks of the same height. And then at around t equals 16, we see this other transition where now the peaks have shifted. They're not at the same spacing, and some of the peaks are a lot higher than others or a lot brighter in this case. And so each transition is marked by a sudden shift in the symmetry. We go from a uniform distribution of pitch to this 12-fold symmetry, and then suddenly giving preference to one pitch or one small set of pitches. And so then we can put together a phase diagram of this system. Um, we have the critical bandwidth on the x-axis and the temperature on the y-axis here. And we see there's a high temperature phase in black here. That's the disordered phase, the low temperature ordered phase in white. And then these intermediate phases, which are labeled with a number of pitches, um, are sort of corresponding to that intermediate band we saw before with equally spaced pitches. Um, and the number here labels how many pitches we see in that given phase. So um, the main difference between the mean field model and the approach I'm taking with renormalization group theory is generally how to treat a large number of degrees of freedom. In the mean field approximation, you sort of uh, ignore a lot of the subtleties of dealing with a lot of degrees of freedom by just taking an average. Um, but RG theory uses the self-similarity of a system to simplify the system into one that has a lot fewer degrees of freedom. Um, so by moving bonds in some way, you can reorganize the lattice into a new shape, which will have the same structure. And then if the structure is the same, then we know the physics must be the same. So we can see that on this image below, um, the bond moving converts this lattice on the left with um, nine lattice sites and a lot of bonds to one with the same sort of unit structure, but only four lattice sites and only five bonds between them. And so we then can say that if the partition function of the system before and after each, after the bond moving um, is describing all the configurations of the system, and then if we have the same configurations in the new system as the old system, then the partition function must remain constant. So our goal will be to write the partition function of the system before and after this bond moving, and then determine how the Hamiltonian must evolve to keep that constant. So the first thing we need to do any of this is to numerically formulate the dissonance Hamiltonian. Um, so this was first formulated experimentally by the physicists Plomp and Levelt. 
And then later the mathematician Sathars parameterized these and put them into nice mathematical functions that you see below. Um, on the left, we see a simple two-tone dissonance function. This is just the dissonance between some fundamental note and a higher pitch. It's a function of the pitch interval dx, which is measured in cents. Usually we talk about intervals in terms of the ratio of their frequency, but we can just take a logarithm and then convert that to a linear scaling. We see that there is a, for different values of this critical bandwidth parameter omega c, there is a different sort of shape to the distribution of this function. There's a peak and then a decay, but the position and the width of that peak is set by this critical bandwidth. And it sort of corresponds to the smallest pitch interval that we can distinguish as two different notes. So for a small value of omega c, we would have very small intervals with high dissonance in there. Therefore, we would be distinguishing a very small interval. So the physicist Hermann von Helmholtz noted that sounds are all comprised of some fundamental pitch with a frequency and an amplitude, and then a bunch of harmonics or resonant frequencies above that with higher frequencies that sound simultaneously. And so he says that the total dissonance between any two notes played on an instrument is actually just the sum of the dissonance over all of the pairs of their harmonics. So we see the full dissonance Hamiltonian that we will be using is on the right here, and you see it's a sum over all of the harmonics. This minimum term uh, accounts for the amplitude of the harmonics, so higher harmonics are generally quieter. So we take one over the minimum of which harmonic is quieter there. And then the factors of M or N here um, account for the frequency of these harmonics. So multiplying the base frequency by some integer to get the higher frequency. The plot on the right here shows that there are peaks at highly dissonant intervals and valleys at um, very consonant intervals. And these red dashed lines represent uh, common just intonation ratios that I mentioned before. Um, you notice that these red dashed lines agree very well with the dips in the um, dissonance function here. We also notice that this is a periodic function with a period of one octave. So this is showing you one period of the function. So we expect the behavior to be similar to an XY type model, which is also a periodic cosinusoidal Hamiltonian. So I next choose to consider music as a system of tones interacting on a fractal lattice with the dissonance Hamiltonian interacting between each tone. Um, a fractal lattice is constructed by taking a single bond between two tones and then replacing it with some subset of um, series or parallel bonds, and then we iterate this transformation. So you can see in the animation on the right here, each bond is replaced with two parallel branches of two bonds in series and sort of a diamond shape, and then we iterate this process to build the lattice. The dimension of a fractal is given by the number of series and parallel bonds added at each step, according to this formula here. Um, so in this case, we add two parallel branches of two series bonds each, so Q equals V equals 2, and then we get the dimension will be 2. Um, regular lattices like square lattice, you cannot use RG theory exactly. You end up with extra terms and edge effects that you have to handle them in more complicated ways. But because fractals are self-similar by construction, the RG procedure will work exactly, and we don't end up with any extra terms. And because there's no literal physical lattice for music, there's really no reason not to consider fractal lattices. So the goal of my project is to explore uh, different types of lattice structures at different dimensions. Um, we particularly expect the high dimensional limit of the RG approach to converge to the mean field result, since at high dimension, you would expect there to be a lot of a lot more um, lattice sites, a lot more nearest neighbors, which is then going to effectively give you mean field behavior. So as I previously mentioned, the goal for us is to move bonds on the lattice in the way that keeps the partition function constant while evolving the parameters of the Hamiltonian. So we start by writing the partition function z, which is given by this formula here, and then we move or remove bonds from the lattice structure and rewrite the partition function. We then take a Fourier transform of both z and z prime, and then the parameters that we want to consider are these Fourier components. So we set z equal to z prime and solve for the parameters or the components of z prime f prime of s in terms of components of z f of s. And this gives us a recursion relationship for these new Fourier components that we can iterate until they converge. So I have some examples here of the different recursion relationships we use. Um, all fractal lattices can be constructed with some permutations of the two basic steps of this series in parallel decimation in the first two rows. Um, for two series bonds being converted into one bond, the relationship is that the new Fourier components is just the square of the previous components. For these two bonds in parallel being reduced to one bond, the um, relationship is this convolution sum over the um, old components. 
And so then to put those together, for example, on this first 2D lattice, we have the two sets of parallel branches. So we first do the series transformation on each branch and then do the parallel transformation to put the two branches together into one bond. And so we see that the relationship is just um, the composition of the two functions before. With this next 2D lattice, it's the same sort of idea, but instead we do it in a different order. So first we take the parallel transformation, put the two bonds to one, and then the series transformation to turn that into just a single bond. Oops, sorry. So then we see it's just the same transformation in a different order. This next one here at two and a half, or at D equals 2.5 or so, um, we can see that it's just a series bond then put together with the outside square, which resembles the 2D lattice, the first 2D lattice from before. So we again just do a, um, a convolution sum of those two recursion relations. And then finally, for this 3D lattice, we notice that it's just the inner two loops resemble this second um, 2D lattice, and the outer square resembles the first one. So then we can just put those two relationships together in that way. So there are three different types of fixed points that we see in Fourier space for the model. Um, the first thing we notice is that um, in this first row, these non-zero values seem to fall off for higher indices. And that's actually because of the way you have to truncate the um, an infinite sum in the case, or truncate the number of Fourier components that we use in the calculation. Theoretically, you would need an infinite number of them, but we can't obviously do that with the computer. So we implemented a correction factor to account for this fact. And with that correction um, involved, you can see the factor in the top right here. Now all the non-zero components have a nice constant value. At low temperature, we see that the fixed point is just a constant. At a slightly higher temperature, we see that a lot of the components go to zero, but then um, some like discrete subset of them will be non-zero. Um, the exact number of how many are non-zero depends on this critical bandwidth parameter here again. So in this case, every 12th component is non-zero. And then finally, at high temperature, only the first component is one and every other component goes to zero. If we take the inverse Fourier transform of these fixed points, we can convert them back into real space and get an idea of what sort of pitch distribution we're looking at. So at low temperature, we see just a single peak at zero, suggesting a pitch distribution with maybe only one pitch or based very heavily around one pitch. At this uh, intermediate temperature, we see that there is an evenly spaced set of peaks um, and the number of peaks that we would see in one octave would be corresponding with the, um, the period of the fixed point in Fourier space. So in this case, every 12th component is down zero. So then if we extend this out to one octave, we would see 12 peaks. And then finally, at high temperature, we just see an even distribution, suggesting that there would every pitch would have the same relative dissonance and there would be no preference for any particular pitches over another. So as a reminder, this is what the phase diagram of our system looked like in the mean field um, approximation. As we use the RG theory, uh, we construct the phase diagrams by using a recursive binary search. So you start with two temperatures in different phases and then keep taking midpoints between the temperatures until move inward until you find the boundary between the different fixed points. So in two dimensions, we see only a low and a high temperature phase. This is um, similar to the costulates through less transition that we see in the 2D XY model. It's a second order transition from a disordered to a sudden ordered phase. Um, as we go to a dimension slightly higher than two, we see this intermediate phase sort of starting to emerge in little pockets along the phase boundary. This corresponds to the intermediate Fourier fixed point. As we go higher to D equals 2.5, we see that it starts to sort of stretch in the temperature domain. These intermediate phases become more pronounced. And by the time we get to dimension of three, the shape really closely resembles that of the mean field phase diagram. Now, the numbers labeling here corresponds to the period of the Fourier fixed point. So in this phase, we have every fifth component was non-zero, every 12th component, but then it goes back to every fifth. This doesn't exactly agree with what we expected from the mean field model where they were labeled with um, the number of pitches per octave and generally were increasing as you went towards the left. The Fourier, the period of this Fourier fixed point seems to be affected by how we truncate the Fourier components and treat the convolution sum. So using more or less components can affect exactly what periodicity comes out and maybe using a number of components that is a multiple of that period would reinforce it, whereas so making things like 5 and 12 very prominent when we use 600 components 
but making numbers like 19 or 31 that we saw in the mean field very hard to find because there's not a lot of nice integer multiples of 19 or 31 in 600, for example. So the work that I'm continuing to do now um, mainly is to implement all of these methods in Python. I had been using Mathematica, which is very precise, but can be very slow. Python can be a lot faster if we don't need such rigorous precision. Um, we're investigating possible sources of numerical error, particularly, as I mentioned, in how we do this convolution sum. When we truncate an infinite sum and only use a finite set of the Fourier components, this can lead to numerical issues, and there's different ways to treat that. Um, one way is to consider periodic boundary conditions, so to assume that the components repeat themselves outside of the range we consider. This should work perfectly fine for the constant fixed point at low temperature because all the values are constant, but at the intermediate fixed point, this may not work because if the number of components we used, again, doesn't align with a multiple of the period, then we might offset and upset the periodic structure by using these boundary conditions. Another option is to assume that all the components go to zero outside of the range we consider. Um, and we can see um, here, there are two plots of the number of Fourier components versus the transition temperature calculated. And it deemed, within each method, they do converge after a certain point but we can see that the transition temperatures between each method don't actually agree. Um, and neither of these is technically correct because as I mentioned, the correct way is to consider an infinite number of components. Um, but we're still working on how to decide which one we wanna use and which one is more justified to use than the others. Going forward, some things we could do once we've optimized this Python approach is to investigate more extreme dimensions, um, particularly determining the dependence of the transition temperatures on the dimensionality um, and determining upper or lower critical dimensions, see if there are certain thresholds where above that point we can say that we've reached the mean field behavior or below that point there's some other set of behavior. Um, the faster Python approach is needed because the recursion relationships for these extreme um, dimensions become a lot more computationally intensive. We're also looking at how to determine order parameters and the free energy from this calculation. The phase transitions have been verified using the mean field model, but we're trying to extract an order parameter and show some sort of discontinuity in the free energy or one of its derivatives, as we would expect in Landau theory. Um, there may be a way to do this by adding extra terms to the Hamiltonian and then redoing the RG transformation, um, similar to when we add, say, an external magnetic field to a system and measure the susceptibility and measure a discontinuity or a divergence in the susceptibility. We'd also like to create correlation functions to tell us the behavior of nearest neighbors on the lattice and the likelihoods of pitches on the lattice. And then we can numerically simulate a lattice and hopefully make some sort of music or melodies using the pitches simulated on the lattice. So in conclusion, we've shown that the physics of musical harmony and pitch subject to this distance Hamiltonian um, works in analogy to the physical phase transitions um, that we see in a lot of other systems. And the RG theory shows this emergence of an intermediate phase as the lattice uh, dimension increases from two to three. Um, the RG results at higher dimensions um, sort of support the validity of the mean field results that Professor Brezovsky has previously shown um, and sort of corroborate that this analogy between music and physics and physical phase transitions is indeed a good one. Um, but there's still a lot more to explore and understand about the behavior within each phase, and I plan to keep working past graduation and develop these methods further for this system. Um, so thank you all for listening. I'd like to especially thank um, my project mentor, Dr. Brzezowski, as well as Dr. Michael Humchevsky, who's helped a lot with developing the RG methods that we've used. Um, I'd also like to thank my friends Mitchell and Chris for helping with that lattice animation earlier and some assistance debugging code at various steps along the way. If I have time, I will take a couple questions now. So we're just a little bit over, but I'm not going to try to keep everyone exactly the time in this remote session. So, and we have a break scheduled so we can make up time if needed. Uh, but so if anyone has questions, why don't you just first unmute yourself and ask? I've got a second screen here where I can try to look the hands. But... Oh, I, I noticed uh, it was a few slides ago. It's the one where you have the 5125, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, uh, yeah, right there, uh, you can see it that there's, it looks like there's a little bit of a bridge between the five and the 12. Is that just a numerical like error or is that something? Yeah, so the, 
the like recursive search that we use to find the phase boundaries um, only goes up to a certain resolution um, just to determine when it stops. So that is just, I believe, um, it found the phase diagram or the phase boundary for one a little bit higher, the phase boundary for the other a little lower, and then it looks like there's a little space in between. But there's those do actually connect when you run this with um, a higher resolution, but that just takes a lot longer. Oh, okay. So one more question, Walter, you've had your hand up, so go ahead. Okay, so my question is, what is the meaning of temperature in here in the musical sense or in the sound sense? Sorry, could you repeat that one more time? What, what is the meaning of temperature? So the temperature is sort of, um, sort of an arbitrary thing that we use to perform the calculation. Um, in the same way that in physics, temperature is just this parameter really that regulates the trade-off between energy and entropy. Um, in this case, temperature is sort of this arbitrary trade-off parameter between minimizing the dissonance and maximizing the variety of notes. It doesn't like have any like literal musical interpretation. It's just we need to introduce this parameter to then use all the same physics methods that we, we know and love. I had, had another idea as, uh, or, or question is the, if you see these phase transitions, can you actually listen to them? If you would translate it in actual sound, would you hear it? Uh, I think you, you, you could in a way. Um, something Professor Berezovsky's done a little bit with the mean field model is um, simulate sort of a three-dimensional lattice of pitches. And you can see as it cools, um, the different like regions of different pitches will start to emerge from just the total disorder. Um, and you could sort of listen to like, um, sort of walk through the lattice and like hear the pitches as you like reach different lattice sites. And so at high temperatures, you would hear that it's just sort of random chaotic noise. Um, but then as the temperature would be quenched down to a lower temperature, you would hear sort of this ordered structure appear, start to hear melodies using more familiar intervals. And so there's a way to do that sort of within the numerical simulation, yes. Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you. We should move on. So Ryan, if you'd please stop your share. I want to apologize to all of our speakers that we can't give you proper applause. People can use their applause icon if they want, but I'll applause for the group. And, and Benny, are you ready to go? Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, so go ahead and share your screen. We can hear you. <laughs> and we can see your screen sharing. Yes, you're good. Just start your PowerPoint. All right, Hi, everyone. So um, my project has been working on an MRI shim coil. Um, and I've been working with Dr. Brown, who's here right now, and graduate students Nul Pan and Sudanine Aragoda. We've also involved a team at industry firm with Quality Electrodynamics, which is located here in Ohio. But I'll get to that. Um, first of all, as an introduction for our problem, um, the basic motivation is that in MRI imaging, um, there are always inherent artifacts um, shown here in these red boxes associated with the magnetic susceptibility of the human body. That is, um, when the human body is subjected to the magnetic fields in an MRI imaging machine, there are additional magnetic fields created by the human body in response. And it's problematic in that these inhomogeneities in the magnetic field um, will result in an excess phase and result in these zebra striping artifacts. And that obscure the features that we're supposed to be looking at. Um, and since they're caused by the human body, um, they appear most significantly at the boundary between human tissue and air. So that's what I mean by a local um, inhomogeneity because um, the magnetic fields appear only in this small region and are of very high order. Um, what's worse about this is that they can be worsened if the geometry of the human body is highly bent or strange in some way. Um, and in particular, we've been focusing at the back of the knee for our project. So this artifact is worse in people who can't bend their knees, such as injured populations or older populations. And so because we can't mitigate this artifact by just telling them to shoot in their knee more, 
um, we have to come up with a different solution to remove this uh, inhomogeneity. And the process of doing that is called shimming. So what shimming does is we calculate the magnetic field inhomogeneity, and we try to reproduce it so that we can produce the opposite one. That way we can um, invert it and therefore cancel it. So these histograms are an actual um, inhomogeneity histogram taken from real data. Um, the left one is the inhomogeneity as read from the data. The middle one is one of their example shimming fields that we could use to cancel it. And the rightmost histogram is that of the properly recentered or rehomogenized uh, magnetic field. So you can see that the first image is right skew, um, indicating the presence of a non-zero homogeneity. The middle image is left skew in order to compensate for that. And the right image is properly centered. But um, the relationship between the left one and the middle one in practice is that we have to calculate the left one in order to mirror it in the way we want to. Now, in the literature, there are actually several different ways that we can accomplish this shimming. So part of it is the full body shimming inherent to the MRI scanner. So most scanners will incorporate some form of shimming inherently um, because, again, this problem is inherent to just imaging a human body at all. But Part of the issue is that because of limited Bohr space, there isn't sufficient spherical harmonic order. So there isn't the resolution needed to compensate the very localized inhomogeneity at the back of the knee. Um, there are passive shimming approaches that involve just placing a material in that resists a change in the magnetic field and active approaches that change the magnetic, that run current through coils in response to um, measured fields in real time. Um, also, there's dynamic shimming, which is similar to active shimming, but it um, produces a target field more quickly in real time and is, has been applied with some success in rats. Um, but for our purposes, um, we've actually approached none of these because um, our approach is to provide a single DC current loop, um, which is placed outside the RF coil that is specifically for the need. And the advantage of this um, approach is that it can basically be turn it on and forget about it, right? So there's no need to worry about, for example, couplings with other electronic components because it's a simple DC current loop. So there are gonna be no inductances or anything like that because once it's on, there's no change to the current and it doesn't produce a change in magnetic flux or anything like that. Um, it's also non-invasive because it's placed outside the RF coil, so it's only placed outside of things that would already be there in the first place. So that's in contrast to dynamic shimming um, or passive shimming, which might involve placing materials very close to the human body, which may be discomforting, or in the case of dynamic shimming, um, the changes in magnetic field, uh, the changes in the current um, that are needed to adjust in real time can also cause unwanted eddy currents. However, the disadvantage of our approach is mainly that we require that the artifact is generic, namely that we want the artifact to be applied the same in, uh, expressed in the same way at the same strength and in the same location for all patients uh, because our coil was is made, it's static and we can't change it um, and the information about the magnetic field is literally encoded in the wiring pattern, um, which is set in stone. Also, the wiring pattern will only apply to the knee. And although our methods may apply elsewhere, um, once our winding pattern is done, it's kind of a one trick pony. Now, in terms of the actual methods of generating this complicated wiring pattern, um, we start with the data itself, as I indicated, um, because the data is what allows us to read off the initial inhomogeneity. So most of my work has been in this part where we've been just cleaning up and pre-processing the data. Um, so this is kind of an image of a, on the left, uh, totally raw phase plot. Um, but after some cleaning up and unwrapping, um, which converts it from this striped thing into a more continuous thing, um, we're able to read off the um, inhomogeneity because the inhomogeneity is proportional to the excess phase. That is, 
um, when we had those zebra striping artifacts before, that was because the spins were out of phase when we expected them to be in phase. And that causes um, the zebra striping artifacts because if they're in a different direction, they'll appear darker or lighter based on the excess phase as opposed to based on the quantity of spins in the material, which is what we actually want to be measuring. So since the excess phase is proportional to depth of not, what we're really measuring here is um, the phase and we're comparing it between two echo times, um, subtracting them and using them to derive how much extra magnetic field that was there um, causing the excess phase. And then at the end, we do get an, a histogram, which is comparable to the histograms that we saw on one of the first slides demonstrating the use of Shimmer. Um, next, once we've obtained this histogram of the magnetic field, um, we're going to try to create it. So um, what we actually do is we expand the current density um, by assuming that it's a half cylinder and expand it in Fourier. And once we've done that, we can minimize the cost functional by calculating the produced field using basic physics principles, um, measuring how different it is from the target field we actually want to be creating, um, represented by this sum over all the indices. Um, and it's a um, L2 distance, so a norm squared. And then also we include this regularization term, which might look familiar to practitioners in machine learning. And what that really does is it prevents both overfitting so that, again, we can keep our coil applicable to um, hopefully a larger proportion of the population. And it also limits the um, total current that is drawn in the coil because this term is proportional to the current density over the surface. That means that we're going to limit how much power this thing draws. And that's also an advantage, um, practically speaking. And then the current density map, which is continuous in the original case, is discretized to finally form the wiring pattern um, that we saw towards the beginning. Um, what the work with quantum quality electrodynamics has been, has actually been producing this thing in real life. So what's been really great is that we've actually been able to see this thing working in real space and um, seeing it applied and actually taking data with it. So um, there are a couple changes that we need to make to the wiring pattern, such as shunting connections so that we can connect it into one big DC coil and so it can be on and off. Um, we also add RF chokes because even though this thing isn't causing problems in the other components, the other components might still cause problems in it. So we need to just damp any oscillations that might occur so that the um, current can actually be just a single DC current. And once the first prototype was made, which is around December, um, we created, uh, we imaged the same patient in the same position to take another round of data to start a second generation prototype. So this goes back to generate new data that started the process in the first place. So as of today, we've actually done two cycles of this prototyping and data taking sequence. Um, in our first cycle, which is shown in this one on the left, um, we got a reduction in the artifact by about 21%. So um, you can see kind of this, there's still the same artifact present, right? There's still the zebra striping artifact, um, but you can see that the how aggressive the striping is has decreased slightly. So if you see this slight diagonal line that's in gray, um, that corresponds to five ups and downs of the phase, and that's been reduced to four. So that's why we got a number of a reduction of 21%. Um, meanwhile, in our second prototype, which is shown in the right image, um, you can see the red box is much improved from top to bottom. So the top is the unshimmed image, and the bottom is the shimmed image, and we've got a much better reduction in the artifact by 67%. And we can also measure these things by just taking the um, we can calculate the inhomogeneity in the same way, and we can also calculate the spread in that as another measure of reduction or artifact severity. Now, in comparison to the artifact reduction that we predicted in simulation, um, the first prototype did worse than expected, whereas the second type prototype did better. 
um, because our simulations predict 47%. Um, but it's hard to give a lot of weight to either of these numbers. So in our first case, um, looking at it more closely, you can see that although the art attack was reduced in this lower region, um, it was actually worsened in the upper region. So in the upper region, we see that the striping has increased by a lot um, in comparison to the first one. So we actually predict that our first one is not really an issue with our methodology or with the uh, uh, coil targeting artifact in a different location than I thought it was going to target, but rather the artifact appeared in a location that was unexpected or we were just looking at the wrong place. So this suggests that the this difference can be compensated for just by a more judicious choice of the region of interest so that if we are actually looking at the place we want to be looking at, um, we can compensate better. And that is evidenced by our much better, our much better performance in the second prototype. Um, meanwhile, for the 67%, this may also be um, due to other factors such as maybe we've overfit to the artifact or simply random variation in terms of whether the patient has moved or um, just um, our coil just handles this certain patient better. And this may be the case in general um, because we only have a small sample size um, based on these two imaging sequences. So there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of whether our coil is actually robust with respect to changing artifact positions or um, whether the knee size or exact position is going to change it. So in general, we just want to aim for a strong reduction on the order of 50%. Um, and whether it becomes better or worse, um, we still want to do at least something. And we have done that. So in conclusion, um, we do have a significant artifact reduction and a, a comparable order of magnitude between experiment and three. But important uncertainty rem remains in terms of artifact position. Um, in case the artifact is not generic and shifts from patient to patient, um, our coil may perform worse or better. And we simply need more data to account for this. Um, but thankfully, um, much of this may be defined by our choice of region of interest. So because we can expand or um, retract our region of interest as required, um, if we just adjust it on further prototyping to account for more of the knee, it may be possible that our coil can address a larger class of artifacts that may appear in different regions. Um, there are also talk of um, enhancing the spherical or harmonic order of our coil by reducing the radius. So if we reduce our radius, we can get um, higher harmonics, which would be even better um, because our artifact is very local and high order. And possibly we could, instead of having just one static coil, we could um, possibly put forth several different designs um, designed for different sizes of knee so that we can have um, I guess kind of a venti, grande, and tall versions of our coil so that we can adjust it based on the patient's knee size. And um, it would still be as easy to operate. It's just we'd have to choose based on the patient. Um, so yeah, that's it for my presentation. Um, in terms of acknowledgments, I'd like to acknowledge the IHI Third Frontier, which has provided funding for the project, as well as both institutions which have um, worked on this project so we have time for a couple of questions if anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask. You anticipated one of my questions early on. I was going to ask, will you need different uh, uh, current or systems for different size knees? And you had a term in one equation that you said could account for that, but you still think you'll need uh, grande and other sizes? Yeah, probably. We've only been imaging one patient so far, so there's still a lot up in the air about that. Um, but like, we can kind of 
judge these things based on, for example, the order of the artifact. Like if it's lower order, we don't have to have such a um, small coil. Um, and obviously there are also other considerations like whether the coil will actually physically fit over the patient. Um, and, and are you generally imaging from the side or do you- Yeah, so all these images are from the side, I forgot to mention. So um, these, this is like the kneecap to the front. You can see the two bones inside of it as well. And then the curve to the right is the back of the knee. So that's why the back of the knee is where we're targeting as the region of interest because um, the back of the knee is the sharpest bend, um, not so much the front. And so that will cause the worst artifact. So are there any other questions? If not, then I'll thank you. Ben. And uh, you can go ahead and then share your screen. And Todd, you can get ready to present. Todd, you there? Okay. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, okay. So give me you can hear you, and I can see you're starting your share. Great. Uh, so okay. uh, it looks good. Well, that's your poster. Okay. Oh yeah, sorry. I I uh, used the poster presentation as my starting point for this one. If that's okay, go ahead then. Yeah. So um, hello, my name is Todd Chang, um, and I um. I'm presenting my project, which is entitled "Utilizing Organoid Smile Laser Interstitial Thermotherapy." This is my poster from your sections, but my presentation is going to be separate from the poster itself. So, um, but first, I want to talk about the background. Which um, so LITT stands for Laser Interstitial Thermotherapy. Um, the surgery is a minimally invasive procedure which allows for safer surgery. So, on the right, you can see an example of LITT with um, different zones of damage. So, um, red shows the highest; it's the highest zone of damage. Um, where the temperature is highest and where necrosis or instant cell death is going to occur. Um, the gray area is where um, apoptosis is going to occur, where like the cells are going to be damaged by the temperature and um, basically just um, kill themselves and to prevent themselves from becoming cancer cells. And um, the outer region is where um, you want to have um, sensitive areas of the brain, which um, will not be affected by the um, therapy and will not cause any harm to the patient. Um, it's uh, for, so. Um, for the organoids, um, which is another aspect of the project, they are three-dimensional cellular aggregates formed from stem cells um, that can be differentiated. So um, on the right, you can see some examples of organoids, um, those little pinpricks in those um, cell wells. Um, they can be, they're very useful to model um, different parts of the body, um, different organs. Um, and um, one recent development was the idea of adding a pseudovasculature. So adding um, I guess um, just like blood vessels and um, other things in order to better model glioblastoma and other types of uh, uh, cancers. So um, next I wanna talk about some current medications um, to alleviate problems with LATT. So LATT um, is a surgery that um, is currently being utilized at UH. Um, it's mostly for, um, it's mostly been, it's being used for real patients being used to treat real cancers, but unfortunately there are some side effects um, and one, um, important one is cere uh, cerebellar edemia. So um, this is just caused by um, damage to the brain, which induces swelling, um, and that that leads to um, various problems. And in order to counteract that, um, they use steroids. Um, for glioblastoma, some other types of um, treatments are resection, which is removing it, and some other like um, treatments such as B I can't bevacizumab and chemotherapy. Um, and so these are, um, so. Glioblastoma right now is being treated by these other um, therapies more often than LITT, but um, hopefully um, in the future, LITT can be used more often. So um, another um, really interesting paper that came out that really kind of sparked this project was um, entitled Modeling Patient-Derived Glioblastoma with Cerebral Organoids. So um, on the left, you can see an example of, um, of um, I guess, um, researchers taking um, stem, like, cancer stem cells, but just basically glioblastoma cells from a patient and putting them into an organoid and then modeling how this um, organoid kind of like invaded this glioblastoma, looking at like different characteristics of cancers that are um, often seen um, in uh, glioblastoma. So for example, um, so looking at kind of like how like these two tumor microtubules formed um, and how like um, the glioblastoma kind of evolved over time. 
just kind of showing that um, it is possible to model glioblastoma with organoids and it has been done before and it's um, going to be done in the future. So now um, I want to talk about some of my objectives. So for my project specifically, I want to show evidence of LTT treatment on an organoid. So taking um, the idea of modeling glioblastoma with organoids and then uh, modeling LTT treatment of glioblastoma on that organoid. And then, and then I want to be able to develop the organoid model to simulate for, um, a multitude of cancer treatments. So um, not just, um, so for example, like taking LTT and adding gold nanoparticles or other types of um, enhancements to LTT. Um, and then showing how um, these kind of methods compare to um, the current, um, I guess, um, treatment and um, see if these are improvements or uh, non-improvements. Um, unfortunately, um, because organoids are um, an, a living system like a rat or a mouse, um, they wouldn't, the results from um, these organoid tests wouldn't necessarily be useful for um, uh, researchers trying to develop, um, or I guess, um, neurosurgeons at UH. Um, but these uh, organoid tests could allow for those um, rat and mouse um, tests in the future. So now that I want to talk about my study design. So first, um, I want to demonstrate evidence of LTT in cell culture. So after speaking to um, a researcher at the Cleveland Clinic, he recommended that I first start with cell culture to get some good parameters to use for my organoid test. So um, the equation I used to kind of, um, I guess, um, give myself initial parameters for my cell culture test um, is shown on the left there. Um, which involves um, the energy required to induce um, apoptosis necrosis, which are different types of cell death, um, and the temperature, and uh, additionally some other parameters of the system. So on the left, on the right, I have an example of the graph I used, which looks at the energy output of laser and course and relates it to the exposure time. Um, so at the curve, um, that's when um, that's at the temperature, the energy required and the exposure time lead to um, an um, induced temperature of around 50 degrees, which is a uh, approximately the point at which necrosis starts to occur. Um, where I guess like more accurately, the boundary between apoptosis and necrosis, um, where apoptosis is occurring at 45 to 50 degrees Celsius and necrosis occurring at greater than, at greater than 50 degrees Celsius. So to the right of the curve, um, that would be where necrosis is occurring. Um, and then for my experiment, um, so I did a preliminary cell culture experiment, which involved IMR32 cells which are very neuron-like, um, which are cancer cells that have been induced to become more neuron-like um, and were used to find parameters useful for the IMR32 organoid tests. So on the right, you can see my results from that, this preliminary cell culture study, which um, I didn't consider as part of my results because um, there were various issues with during the cell culture study. Um, and you can see that, um, uh, and so when uh, some useful, a useful comparison, at least in my opinion, is um, the comparison between bar one and bar five. So bar one, um, had the parameters were um, an intensity of 2.62 watts per centimeter squared at 60.04 seconds. Um, and bar five was um, uh, at intensity of 10.5 watts per centimeter squared for 1.78 seconds. And you can see that for bar five, there was significantly more cell death than bar one. So I took that as um, a kind of uh, update to my uh, model that um, intensity was actually more important than um, exposure time, which could be due to inaccuracies with the parameters or some other aspects of the system that I didn't actually recognize um, when I was first doing the uh, modeling. So now I wanna talk about my some other parts of my study design. So for my organoid tests, um, I conducted them initially with tumor spheres. So um, tumor spheres um, comprised of the IMR32 cells that hadn't been induced to become neuron-like. So they would grow very fast and they could just be used for a lot of tests um, and just figure out like if there are any issues. Um, my later studies then used IMR32 cells exposed to cyclic AMP, which caused them to become more neuro-like um, and um, were used to create the organoids that I would use for my results. Um, I also considered using variable intensity um, to determine the best method of replicating results from LITT surgeries, um, just to, um, because um, I think uh, for LITT, um, it occurs um, in, um, in the, at UH, they use, um, an NDYG laser, which is the same laser I used at two watts. Um, and I used um, different wattages in order to kind of, um, I guess, like look at um, the potential um, ability to um, change the intensity or to kind of match the size of the tumor. So having like a lower intensity for um, smaller tumors. So then um, for my console simulation, so um, I evolved, I used um, different modules such as, which involved heat transfer and biological tissues, um, thermal deformation, um, optical properties. Um, I, I, was trying, I tried to use electromagnetic wave propagation, but unfortunately that was um, a little bit too difficult. 
Um, I then um, used um, these complex simulations to display regions of apoptosis, necrosis, and just look at the overall thermal wave propagation, so how the temperature kind of traveled through the um, object. On the right, um, example of COMSOL, a uh, simulation of a blood vessel. So this is um, the simulation I was interested in using for my console simulation, but unfortunately um, it was hard to integrate with the organoid. But um, you can, on the right, you can see some very interesting um, dynamics. So um, I believe um, this graph is specifically showing um, uh, fluid dynamics, not temperature. Um, and then for figure four, um, I have an example of the IMR32 tumor sphere, um, which I used during the preliminary trials. So I just want to kind of dive in a little bit into kind of what um, equations I use for the um, console model. So um, of course, um, console solved these for me. I didn't have to um, solve these um, myself, um, or like I guess like approximate them, the solution to them myself. So the Penn's bioheat model is um, kind of the um, initial, the first um, equation that was used to, or the first equations developed to model a heat transfer of biological tissue. It's kind of the basis for um, subsequent models such as the DPL dual phase like bioheat model. And it assumes that heat transfer in biological tissue occurs at infinite speed. Um, infinite speed is a little bit of, um, uh, I, I think it's not really well phrased. I, I kind of think of it as um, heat transfer occurring at speed large enough, um, um, significantly um, greater magnitude than any other system or any other process in the um, biological tissue. So it can be assumed as uh, much greater and use, and that's how you can look at um, the Benz bioheat model as, um, I guess, like more simplified. So time lag, of course, um, for how much the tissues are um, around 10 to the negative eight to 10 to the negative four seconds. So that's kind of a justification for why we can assume that these, um, this um, speed occurs at a much higher um, magnitude. Um, one important um, parameter of the Penn's bioheat model is the thermal relaxa relaxation time. Um, and that is supposed to account for non-homogeneous um, natures, but um, essentially the bio Benz bioheat model is mostly looking at homogeneous tissue um, because of the assumption I um, described previously. The dual phase lag bioheat model, on the other hand, is actually looking at more uh, in-depth sort of um, characteristics of biological tissue, such as microstructure interactions. So on the right, you can see um, an image of um, nonlinear micromechanics of soft tissues. So this is kind of showing like all the additional things that um, the Penn's bioheat model doesn't really look into, which involve the extra extracellular matrix and um, other types of um, protein structures in the uh, cells. So now I'll talk about some additional assumptions of um, the model I use, of the Compton model I used in my final paper, in my final um, result. So um, first I looked at the linear acoustic model. So um, I, first, uh, sorry, first I assumed a linear acoustic model um, just to look at um, assuming that applied focal pressure intensity in the study were low. Um, I looked at constant optical acoustic and thermal mechanical properties. So this is something that I was actually kind of interested in looking into as, as modifying because um, my um, a lab is um, an optics lab primarily at, um, under the Dr. Giuseppe Strangi. I thought that having variable optical parameters um, as like, for example, like the tissue changed um, uh, in like absorption coefficients and stuff like that could be really interesting. But um, I ended up not doing this in my final project. I also looked, um, I also assumed that there were no phase changes or chemical reactions in the tissue. Um, and so um, in, um, I quote a paper here in order to show that um, this assumption is um, correct for the uh, temperature ranges I'm looking at. And I also assumed that, um, assumed laminar incompressible, incompressible blood flow. So now let's want to talk about my results from the organo test and the console simulation. So, um, oh, sorry, my bad. So um, uh, here's a animation I uh, made of the um, heat transfer in the, in the um, console simulation. So um, kind of showing how the temperature evolved over time and showing that my model actually could look at um, a period of time uh, between zero and six seconds um, in this case. Um, on the left, um, this example of um, the results from my console simulation, which um, we're looking at um, different regions of the um, organoid. So the red region shows um, the area of necrosis where instant cell death is occurring. Um, and the yellow region is showing where uh, apoptosis should be occurring at temperatures of, um, around 45 to 50 degrees Celsius. Um, and then the right um, example of how temperature evolves over time. So the blue curve showing the maximum temperature and how it kind of uh, reaches um, an equilibrium point eventually. Um, now I just want to talk about my stains. So um, for, for LATT tissue, um, uh, in order to kind of look, characterize it at, um, in those three different regions I uh, exposed, I talked about previously, um, I looked at this study right here, which kind of, which um, looked at, um, which kind of um, differentiate between three different regions of um, LATT, uh, LATT damage. So um, in the very middle region, um, they showed um, with an H&E stain, they showed necrosis. 
So HA needs just staying for um, protein and um, DNA. Um, and they showed that, um, and they were abstain and show, and show characteristics of necrosis in that image I show on the left. Um, outside of that, they showed um, evidence of apoptosis with um, the stains um, with those two images on the very, very right. Um, and then outside of that, they um, on the bottom, they showed um, evidence that these cells were healthy and that they didn't, sh um, they had minimal uh, thermal damage. So um, that led me to um, my, um, my stain, my test with the organoids. So um, on the right, um, I have an example of an organoid stain, um, which is uh, just one section of it, which, um, with, which has like different um, stains um, on it. So for example, it has DAPI, um, which is shown in blue, uh, PSB3, which is shown in red and the stain for apoptosis, and neuronal markers, which is shown in green. So because I was using IMR32 cells, which are cancer-like, um, I had to um, kind of justify that they were um, neuron-like, and so I, um, a neuron, neuronal marker was required. Um, and if you, I'm, I'm not sure if you can see it, but um, there are um, some um, um, neuron-like um, neuron markers um, evident in the organoid. So I, um, with it, I chose to use um, this section. Other sections had different, like varying amounts of neuron marker presence. So I tried to pick um, sections that had the most neuron neuronal marker. Um, and uh, on the left, that's um, you can see my results. That um, this is kind of what I got. So um, I chose the sections. Um, Z10 between, uh, between Z10 and Z16 out of around 30 um, sections. Um, and I have um, the different percentage areas of the, um, of the um, stains um, on the right. So neuromarker was around um, 36 to 55%. Um, percent. The PSP3 area, so the area of um, apoptosis, which was around 35 to 39%. Um, and then for the DAPI area, so DAPI, of course, was being significantly higher and just just showing how many cells were alive. And I was using this to kind of gauge how much necrosis was occurring. So um, now I was to talk about um, kind of like my results. Um, so for my cell experiment, um, I was able to show density dependence of cell death. Um, I, I'm, in the graph I showed, um, I used the normalized version or to kind of give a good comparison. But if I showed you, if I showed you the unnormalized version, um, you would see that um, there's significant um, that um, for higher Populations of cells, there is um, higher um, cell death. And also um, showed um, regions of BAM intensity for organoid testing. So um, showing, um, looking um, at uh, different intensities um, and BAM being the setting that I used to modify intensity and with BAM being around be between 10 and 30. I feel like the cell experiment, the preliminary cell experiment should, exper should be repeated um, in future tests. Um, for the organoid experiment, um, um, I showed um, similarity to neuronal organoids um, with the um, neuronal marker. And also was able to show regions of apoptosis and necrosis. And for the simulation, I was able to indicate potential regions of necrosis and apoptosis, and necrosis and apoptosis, which can be compared to experimental results. Um, unfortunately, um, I don't, um, my uh, results from that, um, I think are a little bit um, interesting because of the fact that I didn't use um, electromagnetic wave propagation. And instead, I just assumed that the laser was a heat point source. So for future studies, I, um, I would want to do an, um, involve gold nanoparticles. So this is kind of like one of the key parts of the experiment that um, the uh, neurosurgeon we were working with, Dr. Indra Sloan was very interested in, which, um, which was introducing gold nanoparticles into, cere into the cerebral organoid to see if uh, altitude could be improved. So basically by using a full thermal effects, by having these gold nanoparticles kind of be activated by the laser in order to cause creation of uh, reactive oxygen species, which are toxic to cancer cells. I also, also want to look at variable penetration. So uh, because um, absorption is dependent on wavelength, um, I want to kind of uh, alter the wavelength of the laser in order to vary the penetration depth in order to kind of um, match the um, penetra penetration depth with the size of the tumor. Um, but unfortunately, that's something that I wasn't able to do um, with my time. Um, and for glioblastoma tests, so um, I want to be able to introduce glioblastoma cells into organoid as well. Um, I was speaking, um, speaking with the um, researcher at the Cleveland Clinic. He was um, he felt that um, he could provide um, uh, glioblastoma cells to me, um, but unfortunately due to various complications, he was unable to um, help out with um, these glioblastoma cells um, during um, the current like um, quarantine. But um, in the future, I feel like that could be a potential um, uh, avenue to um, explore. So um, here are my acknowledgements and here are my references and I would like to thank everyone for um, listening. Okay, uh, any questions, please unmute yourself and ask. Or raise your hands and I'll try to spot you. Raise your hands in the icons. 
So I, I have a question. I'm not sure it's a fair question, but that's okay. Yeah, sure. uh, uh, because it's outside your direct project, but I was curious about the patient experience with this type of surgery. A, how common is it besides UH, but uh, would they sense uh, the heat? What happens to the uh, charred cells afterwards? Are they reabsorbed by the body or? How does yeah, this sure. Work? Um, so I guess um, uh, talking about patient experience, um, so they're put under like heavy sedatives um, and they're kind of, um, and for most of the, the patients use, um, who are given LTT, a lot of them are in a very terminal stage of, um, or in a very sensitive stage of the cancer where other treatments were unable to work. Um, so um, I would say um, that's, uh, I guess, besides that, um, it's a min so it's minimally evasive. So um, most patients don't suffer um, as much, I guess, like um, long-term effects as like chemotherapy, for instance. Um, uh, looking at kind of like how, um, I mean, of course, like the cerebrodemia kind of, um, or like the swelling um, is a, a symptom that many of, um, many of them have. Um, I guess um, besides that, um, there's always risk of, because it's, even though it's a minimally invasive um, procedure, it, it do, does involve um, some, um, some level of surgery. So there's always um, risks of um, infection or other complications besides that. I think um, uh, in the treatments in like, um, Looking at all, all like LTT treatments, there was like one instance of someone who died from infection, which was um, really unfortunate. Um, I guess um, looking at like how the cancer cells, um, looking at cancer cells, I guess um, one aspect of LTT that I didn't really mention was the fact that LTT kind of damages the blood vessels around the cancer as well. So um, some of these um, cell cancer cells um, die instantly, and so they just kind of travel through the bloodstream um, and are just harmless. Um, other types of um, or they just kind of just stay there. Um, other types of, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, other types of, um, uh, or, I, and so other um, cancer cells, um, because of uh, damage to nearby, nearby blood vessels kind of just lack nutrition and just die um, slowly because of that as well. Um, I guess if that answers your question. Yeah, it answers it uh, pretty well actually, except for one thing. I'm wondering if this is considered an experimental technique or is it standard and common? I would. Cancer centers? I would say it's more standard than experimental because um, a lot of neurosurgeons are starting to use it. Um, I would say that it's not being used as widespreadly as, as wide, um, in um, as widespread of a manner as um, chemotherapy, just because of um, technological constraints. Because they need to have an NDYG laser, which not all um, um, hospitals have, and not all um, hospitals have the budget for. Um, I guess. Um, yeah, um, I, I would say though that it's not being used in all patients just because um, uh, I think for, um, the technique is still very new. Um, new and surgeons need to be a, need to have practice with it. And so um, only like, I would say like top neurosurgeons who are very aware of like a lot of like all the different treatments of um, brain cancers um, use it mostly. I, I at least from uh, when I looked at the literature, I couldn't see like a lot of like instances of LHT being used on patients. And a lot of them were involved um, studies to kind of justify why LTT could be used, but it was being used in patients, if that makes sense. No, it's fine. That's a good answer. Okay. Uh, any other questions for Todd? Yeah, um, Professor Brown. Oh, so um, a nice project, Todd. Um, I'm interested in that and in how the gold, maybe you could explain how the gold nanoparticles are actually mediating and improving this, penetrating this, this treatment. Uh, yeah, sure. Wait, uh, let me uh, if you can um, just give me a quick second, I can pull up a slide. I think that would help. Um, uh, I'm, I'm quite interested in uh, nanoparticles and medical treatments. <laughs> so, I think this might, uh, uh, it's not exactly gold nanoparticle, but I think this is kind of a similar idea. Um, so do you see this um, slide here? Yes. Um, it's a very complicated slide, so I'm not gonna try to explain everything, but um, the basic idea is that uh, on the top, you can see an um, example of a nanoparticle, which has um, kind of um, these like green and like blue like um, additions to it, which can, um, which are used basically to um, kind of uh, oxidize different um, chemicals in the um, cell. So in this case, um, turning um, H2O2 
into O2, and then using of the uh, floral thermal effects to kind of um, turn these O2 uh, oxygens into reactive oxygen species, which can then um, modify nucleotides to cause um, DNA damage, which um, leads to apoptosis. So kind of the same, same way that um, temperature causes DNA damage leading to apoptosis, these oxidized nucleotides, um, which cause the, um, cause the damage, which cause the cells to basically just kind of kill themselves, if that makes sense. Sort of a conductivity effect? Conductivity? Um, you were just saying helping to kill or something. Anyway, um, well. I, I, like, I, can, uh, I think maybe I, I, um, I gave a poor explanation. Um, I think um, these, so the, the golden air particles kind of um, allow for these um, structures um, to be inserted into cells, which allow for modifications of chemicals um, in the cells to become reactive oxygen species through different processes, um, leading to um, damage in DNA, which leads to um, the cell basically um, destroying itself because of this DNA damage, which could, which could um, cause them, um, which because um, all cells have a basic sort of um, mechanism of preventing um, themselves from becoming cancer cells, um, which is um, apoptosis. Um, and, because, and so in cancer cells, um, these kind of like mechanisms are kind of deregulated, but if you can cause um, DNA damage using reactive oxygen species, and you can, call, um, you can still cause these um, cells to um, undergo apoptosis, I believe. Mm -hmm. So if that helps. Just a quick follow-up, are they code? Yeah. Are they coded on um, these gold nanoparticles? Yeah. Or like, I mean, um, in, this, in this instance, um, this one is um, coded. I believe- um, It's a little bit like drug delivery. Yeah, I guess, um, I, I think that's a good um, explanation for it. Yeah, a good kind of idea, yeah. Okay, I, I'm not cutting off questions because I don't see our next speaker, Adam Fisher, on my list of participants. Are you there, Adam? Because if he's not here, then we don't want to start. Our next talk is Sam Ehrenstein, scheduled at 11. We have a break scheduled for 10.50. Uh, but if Adam's not here, then what we should do is take our 10-minute break now. And if Adam shows up, we could try to squeeze him in at 10, uh, at, uh, before 11. And if he doesn't, uh, we can add him to the very end of the session, and we'll resume at 11. So I'll keep the session live. I'll stop the recording or pause it. So if people just want to chat, especially the seniors, if you want to chat or ask more questions, uh, feel free to do that. And you can stop sharing, or you did stop sharing, so you're fine. We can try to stay on schedule. We've had a little break, I guess, so that'll be our break. And uh, see so if you go ahead and get started as soon as you can, we'll try to get this done. Yeah, absolutely. Give me just one second to connect some headphones to my audio is all right. Can everyone hear me all right? I can hear you. Okay, give me just one second. Um, it breaks a little bit. I, have you used your phone in the past? Yeah, um, I mean, these we are the headphones try, I've had to try. use. We, we have to try to yeah. conserve time with it. Okay, sounds good. <laughs>
All right, can everyone hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Um, give me just. Give me just a moment. Um, and this is supposed to be like an actual slideshow, right? Yeah, PowerPoint presentation. And yeah. That's what I thought. I just want to make sure. Um, where did that go? If you're not ready, we could tack you under the end of the day at 3.30. Yeah, that would be great if you could. I thought this was supposed to be at our normal time for presenting. I don't know why I did. I thought this was supposed to be at like from like 4 to 5. Okay. Well, then rather than push everybody else back uh, this morning, if you're not ready to go yet, why don't we just extend the break to 11? Yeah, that would be great. I'm so sorry about that. When okay. would I be? So I would be at the end starting at 3.30? At 3.30, whenever uh, Ricky is finished. Fingers, it's it's not going to move like a liquid. It's a solid. It's going to kind of um, all move together. Um. But in this signal is this blood vessel. You can see it's it's basically it looks like a flowing fluid because that's what it is. So it's it's covered up under here, and um, we need to extract utilize computational processing to extract the signal. And the way we can do it is because of the fact that we have a temporal dimension to this. The signals look different in time. So we have to, that we're going to exploit that to separate them along with spatial features. Um, okay, so. Mathematical thing. We assume that the input signal D is equal to T plus B, um, where T is the tissue signal and B is the blood signal. And T is much, the intensity is much higher than B, which is why we can't, we need to do the processing. Um, in our model, we're making an assumption here. Um, what, so first of all, rank of a matrix um, in this, like the rank, or we're talking, when we say the rank of a signal, um, so mathematically, the rank of a matrix is the dimension of the, uh, the the dimension of the column space. So, how many linearly independent columns there are. Um, when we say a signal is low rank, what we actually mean is that um, if you take it, you can construct a low rank matrix that very closely that is very close to the um, its spatiotemporal matrix because obviously it's physically things are never perfect, but we can make a very good approximation. Um, and again, as I said, tissue moves coherently together. Um, so here's an example of a signal. Um, this is like the movie from the last slide, except we've just averaged, these are colored by the RMS average of each pixel over time um, in decibels. So it's it's a log scale because that's what we, I mean. This is what happens when we do just this low rank approximation. Um, we go from this signal, you can't see any vessels to here. Can you see my mouse? Is my mouse showing up? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, these are like, this is like vasculature. This is a first order, like our low rank pre-processing. We have just, what we've done here is we've said that, okay, we do, we can we construct a low rank approximation of this tissue signal, because again, most of the information is in the tissue. Um, most of the energy is from the, the tissue echoes. And then we just subtract that from D to get a first order, like a, a, a rough a guess at the, the blood signal. And you can see this looks like blood vessels, but it's choppy and we need more processing for this to be useful medically. Um, so one method we do for this, um, the most common is known as singular value thresholding for low rank approximation. Um, what we do is we take the singular value, the uh, spatiotemporal matrix, and then essentially what we're gonna do is we're going to construct a, um, we're going to, um, Singular value thresholding is very similar to principal component analysis. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to construct linear, we're going to find linearly independent vectors that span the entire column space. However, the, the length of each vector is proportional to how much of the energy, how much of the information is in that dimension. And then what we can then do is we can um, take the first uh, K, if K is the rank, the first K um, singular vectors, those are going to define a K dimensional subspace of the column space, and then we just project this into the column space. That's going to give us our, um, if we do that, we then say that that is equal to the tissue, because that, that is a low rank approximation of the tissue through this method that is guaranteed. And then the complementary space is going to be um, a higher rank blood space. So we've done this space separation. Now we have our tissue represented and our blood represented. We can subtract out the tissue and remove most of the tissue signal. And that makes further processing a lot easier because we're now trying to clean up something as opposed to just pull it out of this where you can't see it. 
one problem with SVT though, seeing the value thresholding is that it's slow um, and can't be accelerated on a GPU because of um, it, just the way, it, basically GPUs are only, GPUs are very good at doing matrix multiplications very fast. However, SVT requires more than just that. It requires an iterative algorithm so it can't accelerate. Um, so instead we have this thing called randomized low rank approximation or RLRA. Um, it's faster than SVT. It's slightly less accurate. The approximation aren't, isn't quite as close, but it's good enough for what we're doing. And essentially you construct, you just, essentially the way it works, you create a random, instead of creating the subspace, um, your lower dimensional subspace through um, finding the singular vectors, you just pick, you just use a Gauss, you just pick vectors with um, Gaussian components. So they're guaranteed to, they're going to be linearly independent, prob like with probability one, and then you just project into that. And that it turns out works pretty well. Um, and it can be GPU accelerated because it's just matrix multiplications. And um, here's a plot of how they, these two methods perform. Um, the M is the number of pixels per frame. So it's length times width. N is the number of frames. This is the log of the, the Z axis is the log of the number of flops or mathematical operations needed. Um, as you can see, this red surface SVT gets worse faster than linearly because the surfaces are diverging on a log axis. Um, it gets, as we add more um, pixels per frame and more frames, random low rank approximation becomes much quicker. Um, as you can see, as long as we're above about 100 frames per image and like um, like 60 by 60 pixels or either of those, it's RLRA is significantly faster. Um, okay, so here's our novel method. The problem with both of these is that we need to tune them. The main thing is we don't know what the rank is. We don't know what the rank of the tissue is um, and we need to get them. However, so, which means that we need to get it somehow. And there, we don't have a good, there's no good method of doing that. However, it doesn't require training, which means that the methods can just be applied straight up at like ad hoc. Neural networks on the other hand, need a lot of training, but they can be trained to handle a much broader range of inputs. So our idea is, is this, we're gonna combine these two in a two stage process inspired by work called DR squared net um, for, which is for a similar task with images. We're gonna first pre-process the input with randomized low rank approximation to chop up, to um, remove most of the tissue. And then we're gonna fine tune with, to clean it up with a trained neural network. Um, so here's kind of an example of how this is gonna work. With these images, we start with our input. We then apply RL array pre-processing. This is what the output movie is gonna look like. You can see um, th these green lines show the vessel boundary um, where it actually is. You can see there's clearly something here, but the quality is not great. And it, it's choppy and this makes it hard to do certain processes processes like estimate the, the blood flow. Um, so then we apply the neural network. The neural network output vessel, um, it's much cleaner, it's much clearer, it's much more consistent within this vessel boundary versus the ground truth. Um, and it's much closer to this ground truth, um, which is like the actual vessel signal that we see, because this is from simulated data. So here's just another example of how our workflow is gonna work for this. We start with our movie um, from this probe we're going to separate that into patches so that we can do local processing to account for like local variations instead of doing the entire thing at once. We um, apply randomized low rank approximation to processing. We then feed it into the network and then we get our output. Um, this is an example. This is our network architecture. Um, it consists of two residual blocks, which means that we um, do operations in here and then we, but then we add them onto the input. What this does is it allows this. It, it makes training go faster. This has been shown empirically. Um, and it essentially, this is just solving for the, for um, kind of trying to fine tune instead of get the whole thing. Um, this is actually a very simple network. It's pretty small for a neural network. And we did that on purpose because we want this to be able to run on, we want this to go fast and we want it to be able to run on a fairly small, like not super powerful computer. But the architecture essentially, it's going to apply some a series of nonlinear operations in order with a lot of free parameters in order to approximate the transformation from the some transformation function from the pre-processed input to the output to the actual blood cycle. Um, here's a training workflow. It's basically what I just said. We're going to train against simulated data. Um, reason being that um, that gives us a known ground truth, a known target, so we can train against that. 
um, we're going to process it, pre-process it, um, so that it looks like the actual in vivo pre-processed input. And then we just are going to do um, an optimization loop, um, just trying to adjust the parameters so that we minimize the error between the output and the, the, the ground truth. So here's some results. Um, again, these are images, they are movies averaged or RMS averaged over each pixel through time. And then we take the, the um, color of them by the decibel value, so logarithmic way. Um, on the left, we see our input. As we can see, this input, um, you cannot see any blood vessels in here. This is why we need to process it. In the center, we've then pre-processed. We use a rank of 10. The rank of 10 we got by just, we just picked that rank. We train the network on a variety of ranks relative to the actual physical rank in or, so that it can account for um, suboptimal pre-processing um, because anything is going to be better than nothing. Um, you can see these, this yellow stuff, this is, these are clearly blood vessels, but there's still a lot of tissue clutter, this red stuff in the background, and it's going to need a bit of cleaning up, which is what we do with the network. You can now see in red um, the vessels. It's much clearer. Um, We've removed pretty much all the tissue clutter from the background. It's basically black now, which means the lowest value in the image. Um, and actually, here's a specific example, specific example um, of this area. You can see in the this blue oval, there's you can't tell that there's a vessel here on the input. When we pre-process, you can see there's something there, but it's not super clear because of all the tissue clutter. But then when we process with the network, you can see much clearer, much more clearly this is a vessel. There's a blood vessel here. Um, and so, yeah, so conclusions, um, basically this, our, our method works. We got good results on in vivo data while training on simulated data, which is big because it means that it our simulation approach transfers and it, it, this is going to make future training easier because simulating data is easier than getting a good ground truth from in vivo. Um, and the fact that the network's simple means that this is a pretty versatile solution that we can apply on even a portable scanner. Um, which essentially uses a, a phone or a computer. And there's a lot of clinical applications for this, such as cancer treatment or monitoring or um, diagnosis. And our future directions for this project are just refine the simulation a bit, um, train against in vivo with known ground truth, which again, we can get. It's just very time consuming, which is why we are trying to develop this whole method. Um, like it, it's not viable for actual clinical use. Um, and then um, or fine tune it by starting with our train network and then showing it this in vivo data and letting it kind of just adjust itself a bit and also trying some more complicated network architectures. Uh, so we'd like to acknowledge our grant from NIH as well as um, crew high computer computing and our collaborators, uh, Dr. Agata Exner and Dr. David Wilson of CASE. Oh, that's an extra slide. Um, yeah, any questions? Yes, questions? Oh, Dr. Kessler? I think she was just doing the clapping emoji, but oh, okay. a good presentation. But also, um, I guess with a question, when you're showing your simulated data where you're showing like the pre-processed in comparison to the ground truth, um, I guess two questions. How come your background fluctuates so much? Is that just due to your scaling? Um, yeah. Doing this or is it's a consequence of the scaling. Um, yeah, basically. It, it's we've been working on trying to, to deal with that. It's unfortunately the way the network is kind of, or actually not even the network, it's the pre-processing. It's kind of hard to get this, the scaling consistent because if you see in the input, it also fluctuates. Yeah, is there like a physical reason why it's fluctuating so much or is it just, because I mean, it's the entire movie. So it'd be both your signal and your background there. Um, I think so. Um, Yeah, I think it has, it's, I mean, the simulation is like we, is, is a simplified model. So th there's a reason for it. I don't entirely know, but it's, um, yeah, I, I think the re it just has to do with, um, so it's I mean, so, like so, the entire body. Yeah. yeah. So the way the simulation works is that we, um, we have about, we have like 50,000 scatterers randomly distributed. Um, and then we um, we apply um, a Gaussian um, like Green's function, point spread function over them to simulate scattering off of to simulate the um, the equipment 
picking up the, the ultrasound scattering. So I think it's just a consequence of that. I'm not entirely sure though, I'm sorry. But. So any other questions? So Samuel, this is a, another very nice project. Um, I'm really fascinated by the fact that you, on the face of it, you had to get into some interesting linear algebra, you know, with the, with the matrix decomposition and the, and the rank analysis and the single, singular value stuff. Uh, how hard was that? Uh, maybe your mentor just was such a great teacher or were, were you able to be more comfortable with it because of something that happened that you worked on before or was it very new to you? How was it? How did it, how was it getting up to speed on this stuff? Um, I mean, yeah, my mentor, well, yeah, my mentor was <laughs> pretty helpful in like explaining concepts to me and like in our meetings, showing me stuff in MATLAB, like what the stuff does. Um, and also like, yeah, it's, I think I just have a fair amount of linear algebra background. Just like I took a linear algebra class in high school. Um, and like, it's just, I think also, I mean, I don't know, this stuff kind of just comes, I think, I don't know. I, I, some of it is just, I can't explain it. Just, it just makes sense. But you were, you were very comfortable with it. Thanks. So to add to that, when Sam started working on this, it was before his senior project. And after one week, I offered Sam a paid position because he came back and he explained to me, he understood basically every details of the singular value decomposition. So more sophisticated signal processing in terms of non-convex optimization, which I gave him some just basic introduction and he went through and read the paper and everything. So that, you know, he, he, he impressed me from, from, from the get-go. Nice. Great. So Sam, if you'll stop sharing your screen, please, before anyone gets a uh, attack from the flashing lights. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, that, that's another thing I've been, well. Okay, yeah. but I want to applaud, applaud you on behalf of everybody. I saw a few applause symbols go up too. Okay. And Noah, when you're ready, you can set yourself up, screen share, and I'll let you Okay, know. hello. I can hear you. That's good. Uh, let's see. So you got this? Yeah, I've got that. So you can start the presentation. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay. Um, so hello. So this is my uh, senior project presentation. It's about the three body problem in quantum mechanics. And actually, we're also doing uh, more than three bodies. Uh, so I did this project over about the past year with uh, Seth Grabble, who's a grad student somewhere else, uh, and then Harsh Mathers, my project advisor. So we've worked together on this. Um, and basically, the, what I'm going to do here is first, I'm going to set up some background and then I'm going to share our results that we get at the end. Okay, so uh, this is the uh, delta function potential problem. That's what I'm going to talk about first, which is a problem that uh, I guess that most of you have seen in uh, intro quantum mechanics. And so uh, we have Schrodinger's equation and you take your potential function as being the delta function. So it's a single particle in one dimension. And it turns out that you can express this problem as a boundary condition matrix equation, which this is a pretty big advantage compared to having to solve a differential equation because uh, linear algebra type stuff is typically a lot easier to get solutions to than uh, arbitrary differential equation. So um, if you actually solve this boundary condition, you end up finding that there's one bound state that's allowed, and it's uh, this one right here. There are also free states, which are like, you know, the particle doesn't have to have its probability go to zero as you get far away from the function. But um, for a bound state, this is a, you end up getting. And it's uh, symmetric, which is important for reasons that we'll see in just a little bit. So uh, then we can consider, you know, what happens if we have two particles. And this is, I'm talking right now here about the, uh, the way that you would shift coordinates from having you know your delta function between two particles here to something that looks like a one particle case and if you uh look at the kinetic part of the hamiltonian which is uh right like this part the derivative 
um, you see that those actually end up staying separate from each other. So you end up getting this actually looking like one particle in a, like one particle in free space and then one particle with a delta function, even though you start out with two. So this makes uh, expressing answers like between a two body case and a one body case pretty much a one to one correspondence, which is very convenient because if you think about uh, what we got, I said earlier that the one body case for a conventional delta function gets you a symmetric function and uh, bosons are particles that have a rule that their wave function has to be symmetric, which means that you actually get a bound state if you put uh, two bosons together and they have a delta function interaction with each other. And you also get a scattering interaction, which I didn't show, but is true. And However, if you use fermions as a particle and put them in a system, in a 1D system, then they just won't interact with each other. There's no bound state, and they actually won't have any scattering interaction either. And uh, this is to draw a contrast with what we're about to discuss, which is the, the uh, generalized contact interaction here, which was found a few years ago. And the idea of this is that, um, as long as if you impose a parity and a temporal symmetry, then you end up getting that this is the most generic possible boundary condition for a contact interaction. So uh, as you can see, there ends up being three different degrees of freedom, but one constraint because the determinant of the matrix has to be one. So you end up with actually two degrees of freedom for this. Um, but if you take this uh, boundary condition, you can solve it similarly to how you solve for the conventional delta function, except this time, if you pick alpha, beta, and gamma correctly, you end up actually getting two different bound states potentially. And there's an anti-symmetric one, which of course, uh, that's great because I was just uh, talking about um, bosons and fermions being symmetric and anti-symmetric, right? So you end up finding that in a, two particle case, like now both bosons and fermions are allowed to have a bound state and they also have interactive scattering in the exact same way that I talked about with uh, the bosons for just a conventional delta function. So uh, what we were trying to answer in this project or part of what we we're trying to answer was what happens in a many body system if you use the same generalized contact interaction that I just discussed. And so the model that we ended up mainly using for um, n bodies was uh, the, a model called the uh, Leiblin Intergas. And the idea for this is that we have now n particles in a box of length L, and they um, have this potential, which if you notice, this is the two particle potential, but it's just like a bunch of them between every single pair of particles. Um, so. If you use this potential, you can obtain uh, that this is a boundary condition below here. And like the way that you obtain this is the same exact way that I talked about obtaining two particle, like a, the two particle to one particle case. That's essentially what this is. You're taking every pair of particles and turning it into the two particle to one coordinate, and then you're swapping it back again. So that's how you get this. And then uh, the way that this ends up being solved is to use the base ansatz, which is this equation right here, which is essentially you end up with your wave function. Uh, every single coordinate gets paired with every single wave number once. That's what the uh, P is. It's It's summing over permutations here. So you have like a list of n wave numbers, which don't necessarily have to be distinct. And you also have a list of you know, your n particles. And they're permuted in every single way. So you end up with a bunch of waves pointing in a bunch of directions all added together. And the way that you actually solve this, of course, is you find the coefficients A of P, which are multiplying the outside of each term in the summation. Now, uh, the way that you go from here is that you consider now, OK, what if we have our particles have to be numbered in order? So like you have your first particle and then your second one. Because remember, these are in a one-dimensional line. So you can just like enumerate them and say, OK, what if we force the particles to be like this? And that's fine, because the particles are identical. So we're just allowed to do that. And assuming that these are bosons, 
then you can find using uh, symmetries of the system that you actually get this boundary condition that totally describes the uh, boundary conditions for the system, which is pretty significant because here you see there's a J and K, so you get uh, N squared basically as the number of different boundary conditions that you have. But here there's only one index, so you only have to look at N different boundary conditions. And it's, they're actually slightly different numbers because you end up adding or subtracting a few, which is why I have them as a big O of N and N squared. But the point is that this is a lot more efficient and you can actually solve for A of N based on these, which you couldn't do for the more general case. Um, so if we go back, you know, yeah, you or okay <laughs> so um if we have you know i said earlier that we're doing the uh, lambda times delta for um contact interaction right so if we take this this parameter and take it to zero then you get a non-interacting Bose condensate which is like it's kind of obvious that you get whatever the non-interacting solution is if you just make the interaction not exist now, uh, this is opposed to if you take lambda to just to infinitely strong, essentially, then you get a tonks gas, which actually acts like non-interacting fermions. And you can also solve for between those two extremes, and you end up getting a non-trivial soluble state. And the thing is, uh, you can solve for correlation functions, and it's actually been measured, and it agrees experimentally with systems that have been created that are exactly of this form. Um, and I have like down here, that's an article that you could look at if you wanted to. So um, now if you take the generalized contact interaction and you do the same thing that I just described doing for the Liebel and Intragas, except this time, instead of using the matrix that we used for the delta function, you end up using the matrix that you use for the generalized contact interaction. You end up being able to reduce the boundary conditions to a big O of M again. And now you have this, uh, the two gamma over alpha plus one, instead of um, the thing that you had earlier for, which was just, uh, I think we were lambda over two, yeah. So it's slightly different, but it's like essentially the same thing. So this isn't that exciting in terms of bosons because you still end up with systems that will end up looking essentially the same even with this new contact interaction but the uh kicker is if you do this with fermions because as i said uh, originally i think if you do the lead linear analysis on fermionic particles like the symmetry for that just like implies that you get non-interacting fermions as the only thing that'll happen. Like it doesn't matter what your contact interaction is. If it's a delta function, it doesn't matter how strong it is. They're just not going to act like they interact. And uh, in this case, you can see, well, that's not the case. You do actually get an interaction. Um, so this is, you know, this is very similar to what the boson stated. So you'd expect to see something somewhat like that, <laughs> but uh, we don't know exactly because, you know, th this hasn't been around yet, obviously. Uh, so what we want to do uh, next with this, basically, this new state is that we want to actually find how would you realize this state, which we're still not sure how to realize it. We've been working on that, but uh, we don't have anything yet. Uh, we want to calculate the correlation functions for it and uh, other measurables, which uh, we're fairly confident, but this first like actually find a realization will kind of determine what measurables are the most important to us, which is why we haven't done that yet. And then uh, in the long term, we want to extend this to spinful fermions, which uh, if you remember fermions, like one of the things is that they always have spin in uh, n plus one half, like that's what their spin looks like. So what do we mean by spinless fermions? And what we mean by that is that when you actually set up these systems, you take the fermions and you put them in a magnetic field that forces their spins all to point in the same direction. And then they just act like they don't have a spin because that degree of freedom isn't there for them anymore. Okay, and I also wanna talk about um, something that we did with three bodies, which is somewhat separate, but I thought would be worth talking about. 
Um, and the deal with the three body interactions that we looked at were uh, that we don't actually need to constrain it to bosons or fermions. We just can look at a system of three arbitrary quantum mechanical particles. Um, and uh, I, and a lot of this was I wanted to share this. This is the three body coordinate change that you end up being able to do to turn a three body system into a one body system in a two dimensions. And uh, how I said earlier that the two body coordinate shift ends up keeping your kinetic terms in the same form, it still works for this too. So you end up with actually just one particle. And then, you know, you have another particle in free space, which represents uh, this coordinate here, which is the center of mass. Or not center, but it's like the center of the system. There's no masses here yet. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, when you actually solve the system, you end up setting it up in this way with different delta uh, function fences is what we've been calling them. So, you know, you end up with right here. So you have your particle moving and these are where the potential happens and you have to calculate different wave functions. So um, there's a solution known for the regular delta function and I have the paper here. It's been known for a long time and we're still trying to adapt it to generalized contact interaction, which we're pretty close to, but we're not like, we don't have a, an exact form yet that we're ready to share. So I didn't want to put that there yet, but we're uh, pretty close. Um, and anyways, uh, so this is, what we've done this year. Okay, you ready for questions? Yes, of course. Uh, okay. Let's see. There you go. Uh, Kurt has his hand up. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, so you mentioned that there is this two parameter family of possible contact interactions in one dimension. But I could imagine writing down a delta function potential with arbitrary number of derivatives on the delta function. That would seem like an infinite family. Where are all the rest of those? Uh, I want to say that um, if I understand your question properly, um, like I'm not sure. I I wouldn't be surprised if it's because we want it to be in this matrix form specifically that causes the rest of those to drop out. Like it's because these are linearly dependent on each other, right? Well, you could just make a bigger matrix if you had more of them. Well, uh, there's when you're doing a contact interaction, you only have like the two different sides, right? And then you're taking the two different derivatives and we want the second derivative. Like we don't want that to matter in this, but uh, so I guess I'm not sure. <laughs> that's my, <laughs> That's my best guess at it. <laughs> I think Professor Matur is ready, is unmuted himself. Uh, yeah, I guess I just wanted to say, uh, no, you've given the answer. So it's, you, the only thing you need to change about the answer is the bit where you said, I'm not sure, right? Uh, <laughs> you pointed out that uh, we want psi and psi prime and not psi double prime and so forth to appear in the boundary condition. We don't want higher derivatives than that. He said that, and that is the answer. <laughs> OK. Are there other questions? If not, I have one. I want to, I guess, challenge you on one of your disclaimers that you included, was that you weren't sure how, what a realization might be like. And you talked about uh, experiments on cold atoms, etc. What would an experimentalist do that would connect to your theory? Oh, I mean, what they what what you would be doing is you'd be having a cold atom system. I think I alluded to this, but maybe I didn't explain it very well. Um, so basically, you have there are ways that you can create a optical lattices to trap atoms in one dimension, essentially. So you can actually build a system of a bunch of bosons in one dimension and have them like that's been done before. And what we'd want to do is just make our particles do that. And so in those experiments like you can measure thermodynamic constants and the correlation functions and that's why yeah so that's what it would look like we just don't know actually how you build the system that has them interact in the way because like it's easy enough to build well it's relatively easy to build one that has delta function interactions but uh this like more exotic interaction is harder to think about okay well are there any other questions 
then I'll thank our speaker. <laughs> thank you. And you can, uh, okay, you've unshared, and uh, we're about on time. So, uh, Benjamin, if you're ready, you can go ahead and get yourself set up. Let me just share my screen then. Or is everyone seeing the presentation? Yes, it's fine. All right. So this project is entitled Incorporating LIGO Detector Data Analysis into Computational Methods Curricula. I have conducted it with uh, professors Schottner and Mature, both of whom are in the room right now. Uh, I don't want to delay us getting to lunch, so we'll get right into it. So gravitational waves were proposed as part of general relativity by Einstein in 1916. Well, there was the, the idea had been thrown around before then, but that was the first time it really like went mainstream in the physics community. Um, their existence was initially somewhat controversial. Uh, Einstein himself came to believe that they were just uh, artifacts from using weird coordinate systems and didn't actually physically exist in a way that was detectable. Uh, physicists started to accept that they would be detectable in theory because of something called the sticky bead argument, which was popularized by Richard Feynman, um, which basically says that if you have a, if you have beads that are stuck to a rod, that and the beads are shift their position is shifted by an incident gravitational wave, then the beads will have friction with the rod, which generates heat. And heat is not something you can eliminate by changing coordinate systems. So this means that you can detect gravitational waves, that you can physically say when a gravitational wave has hit something. Uh, so physicists after that got really excited about the possibility of detecting these gravitational waves. They had a few false positive detections. There was also um, an exciting moment where some physicists found that a I believe a system of binary pulsars was losing energy consistent with gravitational wave emissions, but they didn't detect the waves themselves. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, the LIGO project started, uh, which, and they were, they built these colossal interferometers that were on the order of miles in length, one in Livingston, Louisiana, and one in Hanford, Washington, to detect gravitational waves. Um, and they, Finally, detected a wave on uh, September 14, 2015. They announced those results on February 11, 2016. And since then, we've detected about 50 events that cause gravitational waves. So gravitational waves originate from certain types of accelerating masses. The first, the first uh, event to be detected was two black holes orbiting each other and merging. This image right here kind of shows what's going on. I wish I could have one of those moving GIF images, but I don't think PowerPoint supports that. Um, and the, so all matter energy, and this is just, re, just relative to gravity, affects the curvature of space time, and this can propagate in a wave like form. So that's where they come from. Um, and larger mass objects like black holes or pulsars or neutron stars or things like that create more powerful waves that are easier to detect, although even those waves are still very difficult to detect with the instruments we currently have. Um, so the interferometers that LIGO uses and that some other projects like uh, Virgo in Europe use um, if the uh, mirrors are displaced, that indicates warping in space time from a passing wave in theory, although there's also many, many possible sources of noise and sources of error, which we get into later. But the displacement only happens on a scale of about 10 to the minus 18 meters. So that's that, and that's on the massive like mile long interferometers. So that should give you an idea of how hard these are to spot. Uh, the, pow the power of the uh, of the gravitational waves given 
roughly by this function, which was published in an earlier paper with Professor Matur. Uh, this is this is like the non-general relativity version, but it's still fairly accurate. So you can see it's related to the mass of the two objects, the frequency of the orbits, gravitational constants, and the speed of light. And also alpha, which is just a proportionality constant. So in this image, we see uh, we see a plot of strain, which is like basically the linear displacement in the interferometer versus time. Well, time axis isn't labeled, unfortunately, but this x axis is time. Um, so these these upper two graphs, one from the Hanford detector, one from the Livingston detector, um, show the show the data after the noise has been filtered. Um, and these other two show the data after it has been uh, matched to the theoretical predictions. Um, the, the reason you have two detectors is that because the waves propagate at finite speed, they propagate at the speed of light. So if you know which detector it hits first, you know which direction it came from. Um, although the, diff the difference is only about 0 0.01 seconds. So it's very small, but still noticeable. And all these results are available at uh, the Gravitational Wave Open Science Center, which is a website that's uh, which is a website run by the LIO project. So that physicists or just enthusiasts can look into this stuff on their own. So we've we've been using that data because obviously we can't build our own mile-long interferometers. Uh, we've been reworking and simplifying the data analysis methods that they've been using. We're hoping that we can get more or less the same results. So far, it looks fairly promising. Um, and we're investigating possible applications of these methods in teaching data analy analytics and computational physics at the undergraduate level using the real, the real techniques that actual phys physics researchers use in reality. So obviously, the first step is to get the data that we're going to use. That's not very difficult, so there was an issue with weird file types that we had to circumvent. Um, we want to window the data to prevent artifacts in the frequency domain, uh, and then we want to convert to the frequency domain, which for which we use the fast Fourier transform. Um, once we've got it in the frequency domain, we can uh, whiten and bandpass the data, which uh, makes detect noise less related to frequency. So we don't have any frequencies. They're just like so full of noise, we can't use them. Uh, we then we use band passing to get rid of those frequencies that still have like a disfavorable signal to noise ratio. And uh, at that point, we expect to see something resembling the signal. Although ideally, we'd still be able to clean it up, but our time is limited. So, the data is, in theory, an infinite time series going from the beginning of time to the end of time. Uh, we obviously can't take data from the beginning of time to the end of time, um, which means that if we use a finite subset of points in time, which we have to, we are essentially taking a window of the data that is defined by a rectangular top hat function that is equal to one at all at all points over the time interval and then goes to zero immediately afterwards which is not ideal because those uh those jumps from one to zero can introduce artifacts where there is stuff happening over every possible frequency and that's that's not helpful that make that messes up our data in ways that are difficult to deal with. So what we do instead is we use this function called uh, the Tukey function, uh, which decays from which decays from one to zero at the beginning and end of the time interval. Um, this this in this function we use a time interval from zero to fifty, although the actual time interval is obviously much greater than that. Um, and that yields this graph, 
which you can see is still very noisy and messy, but it goes to zero at the beginning and end, which is what we want. That means that the stuff at the beginning and the end aren't introducing any weird artifacts into our data, and also we're not dropping enough data points to really affect the overall trend. So once we've windowed the data, we can transfer to the frequency domain. We do that with the Fourier transform, which is given by this function here. Although in our case, we don't have an explicit function, so we have to use a sum instead of an integral. But it's the same basic idea. What we're and what the Fourier transform does uh, is it transfers from time domain to the frequency domain by multiplying the function by e to the negative i2 pi frequency times time. And then we integrate over time so that time is eliminated from the equation. We have a function in terms of frequency. Um, and with once we have it in the frequency domain, and in the frequency domain, uh, the time series we're working with looks kind of like this. We don't, we don't fully know what's happening with this weird peak, but hopefully we can figure it out soon. Um, that means we can uh, determine what domain, what parts of the frequency domain noise is strongest or weakest in, which is important if our objective is to eliminate some of that noise. So data whitening is, it comes from the same idea as white noise. And white noise is, of course, noise that is even over the whole set of frequencies. And by the same token, whitening means that we are evening out the noise strength across frequencies. So we can see more or less the same amount of noise at any point within the frequency domain. Um, And once whitening is complete, we can apply a band, we can apply bandpass filtration to the data set, which blocks out most frequencies because we know that we only need, really need a few frequencies to detect the signal. Um, and by doing that, we eliminate frequencies that are mostly or entirely noise, but key frequencies with a signal to noise ratio is favorable enough that we might be able to identify a signal through the noise. And you'll, you'll you and as you could have as you might have seen on the previous graphs from LIGO, there there is still noise once you've done this. It's still like not extremely clean, but you can see that something. You can see that there's something there. So we've been doing, we've gotten a lot of uh, frequency domain analysis done, uh, windowing and the Fourier transformation is working very well in our code. Uh, the whitening and band passing is also going pretty well. We're not quite done with that yet. There's still a lot of debugging to be done. Um, ideally, we would then match filter the data, which means instead of just eliminating noise, we look for data that resembles the theoretical prediction, um, which we might, we might not get to that, unfortunately, because we are running out of time now. Um, but that would be the logical next move to make. Uh, we would also be interested in the future in evaluating the null hypothesis, which is to say, given a particular set of data, because, you know, there's years worth of LIGO data now, and each signal lasts less than a second, which means in any given data set, it, it might very well be entirely noise. There might be no discernible signal. So we would like to be able to determine, given a, given a particular data set, whether there is a signal or whether it's just noise. Um, there's a... And we, we do want to look more at the educational applications of this. Um, we want to be able to determine if this could be implemented into computational methods curricula. We, we, th where we, think, we think it could potentially be. We think that there is promise with this idea. But we'd want to work more directly with instructors and students to evaluate that 
possibility in detail. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, my two great advisors, Professor Batur and Professor Chotner, uh, and also Professor Chotner for running 352, the class. And uh, with that being said, I'll open it up to questions. So any questions for Ben? I had the opportunity this year to ask him lots of questions, so I don't have any more right now. I don't see anyone with their hands, icons raised or unmuting, so. It looks like there are no questions, so I'll just thank you, Ben, for your presentation. And we can adjourn for lunch. You can stop sharing your screen. And so the plan is to adjourn for lunch and resume at one o'clock. And I'll hang on at the session in case anybody wants to talk or you want to talk to each other. And Sam, are you still here, Daniel? I'm right here. Okay. Yeah. I forgot to start the recording at the start of your talk, and you forgot to remind me. Oh. I just want to let you know the first few minutes are, are missing, and it was a good start, so okay. it's a shame. But uh, just in case you wonder or you need it. Okay. I mean, I, I have did a, start after a few minutes. Okay. I have, like, for um, the conference, we've recorded, like, a 30-minute version of that presentation. Okay. No, I didn't see that. You know, everyone knows, I guess, I did go to all the uh, intersections. Oh, this was for like go to the live ones. Oh, this is for like an actual like like industry conference. Oh, okay. So I have a, a copy of myself presenting. Okay. So if people want to leave uh, this meeting and then come back at one, that's okay. Because I'll actually I'm going to stop the recording. Do I have another?